Okay, so now for something completely different. We is a great story. A heart-rending drama of togetherness. It's a tale of solidarity through tough times. A vision of endurance in the face of adversity. We has horror. It has family drama. It has conflict. Even occasionally, we has redemption. I'm letting you read these for yourselves. In short, we has all the characteristics and the possibilities of a great plot. Togetherness, suffering, endurance, and confrontation all rolled into one. As a pulling together, a bulwark in the face of danger, we is what Hannah Arendt called a form of narrative action. We is a vow, a story, which is also in part, as has already been suggested today, a legal contract. We the undersigned, is not just a plot with a carefully laid structure, but is a system, a path that has already been beaten and that continues to contour our way of life, our techniques of living, as Foucault had it. We isn't just the living, it's the dead too. It's what happened once upon a time when in dark days, we struck out together carrying so little possessions, only the coats on our backs. We got stuck in, we struggled, we invented, we survived, we died with our friends and our fellows. We is the future and our struggle to attain it. We shall not, we shall not be moved. And finally, we is the very earth that we will protect or destroy or be destroyed by. These quotations are not randomly chosen, but are taken from, yes, of course, famous politicians' speeches, but also from an artwork entitled What Where by Rod Dickinson in collaboration with Steve Rushton. I did this to show really that what looks initially like politics often turns out to be art and vice versa. What I'm interested in here is the way that we, as a story, operate simultaneously on both political and aesthetic levels, essentially as a construct of both. And perhaps because of the way that stories sweep us along with them, we don't always notice that we is necessarily a mode of address. Essentially polemical, we is a mode of power, one adduced by narrative. We calls forth action in the world. To point to the conjoined aesthetic and political qualities of the story of we is not to undermine either its possibilities or its force. On the contrary, we is the, the basic narrative device used to structure the homogeneous empty time of what Anderson famously called an imagined community. There again, we is a structuring principle, a sequencing of time and space that is at once fictional and historical. A story that, as Arendt put it, constitutes the web of relations in which political action takes place. Of course, Arendt's position does not imply that the universe is merely the product of narrative interpretations. What she wants to emphasize instead is the inescapable situatedness of narrative, whose power is necessarily both aesthetic and political. Stories are at the heart of politics, the latter of which, as Benoit Chalon once pointed out, is the very struggle for people's imagination. In imagining the web of relations in which action takes place, political consciousness is aesthetically shaped. So by casting we, and here I mean casting in both senses of the word, as both a throwing forth and as a kind of dramaturgical act, by casting we as a publicly performed mode of narrative action, we can see that it's not just of shared concern for both art and politics, but it's actually a shared mode of operation for both. In blurring the boundaries, as Arendt observed, between what is intimate and what is public, storytelling creates a bridge between individual passions and those perspectives which can be contested and interwoven where society and state, as she says, flow into each other like waves in a never-resting stream. Arendt recognizes in stories our desire to feel connected and the function of the story in forging those connections. The story of we is neither wholly imaginary nor wholly empirical, 
but constantly shifting between the two. On the one hand, we imagine how we belong or don't belong to a world larger than ourselves. On the other hand, this imagined rootedness or lack of it is itself a kind of social fact linked to an actual experience in the world. The story of we is one in which assumptions, ideologies, histories, imaginings, impassioned forms of thinking, experience, and aliveness are all necessarily entwined. Of course, stories are seductive. As well as helping us make sense of the world, they can swallow us up. They allow us to reflect on fields of experience that we share with others, but they also, just as trenchantly, exaggerate differences, foment discord, and do violence to lived experience. Concealing as well as revealing, for every story that sees the light of day, there are numerous that go untold. The most powerful way, then, of critiquing any story is to subject it to the interrogation of more stories, which is why today I want to turn to three stories that give different accounts of the we. The first of my stories is also called We. Published in 1924, Zamyatin's sci-fi novel was the first major work of fiction to be censored by the still nascent Soviet government. The novel questioned the validity of scientific instrumentality, which was a central plank in the regime's, in, in the regime's program for societal transformation. We, the novel, is often considered the prototypical dystopic novel Though interestingly, there are also critics who call it a utopian text. This demonstrates the kind of structural ambiguity that allows such contradictory ideas to emerge in the novel simultaneously. For those who haven't read it, the book takes the form of a journal kept by a mathematician called D503. D is, thought, is torn between his faith in state orthodoxy, yearning for perfect order on the one hand, and a growing awareness of his own disorderly idiosyncratic subjectivity on the other. The pervasiveness of state control is made clear from the first pages of the journal, which reads, every morning at the exact same hour, at the exact same minute, we the millions rise as one. We uni millionly start work and uni millionly stop. Merged into a single million-handed body, we bring spoons to our lips, we go out for our walk, we go to the auditorium, to the Taylor Exercise Hall, which is, of course, called after Frederick Taylor. What the novel we is concerned with is the mass cultural homogenization of Russian society, which at the time was being conducted in the name of progress. The novel thus imbues technology with human traits, transforming machines into vehicles for creation. We hear, for example, of musicometers, which by simply turning a handle can produce up to three sonatas an hour. Problematizing this tale of unimillion performance, however, D503's journal attests to his personal disintegration in the face of one state's technological glory. He falls madly in love with a woman called I-330, who is embroiled in a resistance plot that ultimately fails. The love story is thus set against a political conflict between one state, the glass world, and the green world, the very existence of which, beyond the walls of one state, reveals the fragility of its oneness. <coughs> Dee's journal tells the story also of a political conflict, but also of a conflict between personal and ideological demands of emotion and reason. On one level, the story is about Dee's desire to integrate his illicit love for I-330 with his social identity as a citizen of one state. But on the other, we is also about a struggle between reason and imagination, between the traditionally opposed concerns of political philosophy and aesthetics. As a mathematician, Dee relies on probabilities and the exactitudes of reason, but he is increasingly plagued throughout the novel by imaginative desires which constantly intrude in the form of dreams and fantasies. So interestingly, it's not just the personal and political that are confused in the novel called We, but also the question of how the aesthetic relates to, the, to bureaucratic government and the way the aesthetic is linked to the question of political autonomy. Dee's struggle between reason and imagination escalates as he enacts the contradiction that is internal to all notions of auto autonomy, i.e. between auto, the self, and nomos, the law. What concerns Zamyatin is the way that developments in technology impact on his character's aesthetic and political autonomy. At issue in we, then, is the extent to which we can speak of a we or a plur plurality at all, 
without transforming it into a substantial and exclusive identity. In many ways, then, this is the same question that Jean-Luc Nancy is asking in being singular plural. But while Nancy argues that the, cur the recurrent longing for a harmonious community of norms and values has throughout history been frustrated, Zamyatin explores what the longing would look like if pushed to its logical conclusion. In both cases, the idea of a plurality or a community is never innocent. If the quest for what Nancy calls pure exteriority is only a nostalgic longing, albeit one that he insists haunts the whole of Western philosophy, in Zamyatin's we, it nevertheless has the potential also to be pure nightmare. Elsewhere, Nancy uses the concept of immanentism to describe the way that communities try to protect themselves from external influence. And again, Zamyatin pushes this immanentism to the very limit in the notion of the one state. The second story of we that I want to consider today is that of Gert Hoffmann's novel, The Parable of the Blind. This novel responds to Bruegel's famous painting of the six blind beggars stumbling into a ditch. It's remarkable for two reasons. Sorry, is this too much feedback? Okay. Is that better? Is that better? Parable of the Blind, Hoffman's novel, that is, is remarkable for two reasons. Firstly, for its use of ekphrasis as a rhetorical device that operates in modes of address. I don't really have time to elaborate this here. And secondly, for its continued use throughout of the singular plural pro pronoun, which again casts the we in a narrative mode. The novel's narrator is a composite one, comprised of all the blind men of Bruegel's painting who stumble about as if one. The best way to give you a flavor of this is by quoting a short passage from the book. Here goes. Slowly clawing at one another, we get out of the straw, struggle to our feet. Then we grope at ourselves and at one another. For there are several of, of us, even if only one speaks, the other listen. Then we pass our hands over our bodies. Yes, we're still the same people as yesterday. The novel follows the men on their way through the village to try to find the painter who's about to paint them. In comparison with Zamyatin's novel We, Hoffman's iteration of the We is not about the power of the We, but about its very helplessness. The line of men are exploited subjects who, for the benefit of the painting, must repeat the traumatic experience of falling over and over again. In this way, the novel deals not just with the aesthetic representation of the we, but with its political representation too. Clearly, the painter in the novel is an authority figure charged with, in Rancierian mode, as it were, the distribution of the sensible. In contrast, the blind men, the we, who, are, who, who continually speak, are one di undifferentiated composite mass. As the novel says, a single knot of gray bodies rolling along the street like a deep sea monster. The beggars are not autonomous beings, but outsiders, defined by their physical appearance and by the limited contributions they can make to the community. Differences between the marginal and instituted iterations of the we are exacerbated by the blind man's constant disorientation. They have to rely on the villagers, who often turn out to be unreliable and sometimes treacherous, in order to orientate them geographically. As outsiders, it is the beggar's duty to stick to the margins and get out of the way of fully functioning society. Their physical connection to one another by means of hands or walking sticks casts them like a row of dominoes inextricably linked to one another in their repeatedly enacted fall and in their repeated rejection from society. As a representative in the world, the painter sets them up like objects, and in the attempt to make their plight visible to the rest of the world, the beggars injure themselves repeatedly, suggesting that this attempt at humanization of the we is achieved only as a result of mental and physical torture. The story forces readers to share in the way that uncertainty plagues the blind we. The word, prob the word probably abounds in the text. And if even the beggars can't be sure of their own characteristics, well, the reader certainly can't. The link between language and reality becomes more and more tenuous. The beggar's temporal and geographical landscape continually shifts and is subject to sudden reconfigurations. For example, when they believe that they are huddling in a secluded corner, but it turns out that they're making a spectacle of themselves on the village green. 
As the certainty of language slips away, the reader's anxiety increases dramatically. Confined to the same world of permanent uncertainty, there can be little confidence in anything that this composite we says about the world. My final example, in contrast with the two novels, seeks, if not to resuscitate the we, then to re-fictionalize it. This is a visual example of narrative called Rogue Game. Um, Rogue Game is, uh, attempts to, I, I argue, attempts to put into play the idea of contingent narrative, a narrative which takes a preset, standardized account of sequence, time, and order, and improvises around it. In comparison with the previous two narratives, Rogue Game sounds a more optimistic note. The game consists of the simultaneous play of three different games, five-a-side football, volleyball, and basketball, all of which are paid at the same time in the same court. In the image, you can just about make out the, the colorings for the different games marked on the court. In this way, the games are immediately put into competition with each other as players have to adapt their behaviors to accommodate the other games going on at the same time. The original rules are abided to as much as possible, but the simultaneity of time and space means that the people playing have to find creative ways of adapting to a new environment. They have to negotiate physical obstacles, moving at different speeds, going in different directions, and trying to do different things. Interruptions necessarily fracture the normal order of play and introduce elements of indecision. Negotiation and compromise are vital just to continue the game. The game doesn't try to conceal these overlaid layers of existence, however, but stages them so as to demonstrate a continued interaction between the various sets of rules and regs and the complexity of renegotiating them in real time and space. Gradually, the original rules are eroded and something new is produced in improvisation, such as where, for example, a basketball player decides to kick a football into goal. What happens then? The boundaries between the games shift as each team has to think beyond its immediate goal. In this way, Rogue Game produces a kind of visual narrative that tries to speak about the complexity of partnerships, boundaries, and communities. One of the very interesting things about the game is the way that it's constantly on the verge of chaos. In the rendition that I saw at Spike Island in Bristol, the presence of the St. John's Ambulance crew loomed large throughout the whole game. But the other striking feature of the, the game was the way that it was such an utterly joyous event. I have never seen so many people laughing in a gallery in my life. In closing then, Rogue Game, I think, touches on issues that I mentioned earlier in relation to Nancy's conception of a singular plural. Nancy proposes an ontological state prior to being, which he terms being with. Being with is constituted not only symbolically, but also more importantly, through processes of affect. The politics of being with is palpable in Rogue Game, where we is not a static entity, but a dynamic physical space of constant improvisation, literally a game whose rules are both fixed and changing at the same time. As Nancy argues elsewhere, to exist is at once an ontological fact, an ethos, and a praxis. To exist is to be with, to be exposed. What is at issue is not so much a confrontation between a plurality of different existence, all trying to exercise absolute autonomy, but rather an experience of what Nancy calls the spaciosity of the world. What Rogue Game offers, I think, is a kind of fictionalized proposition, not a limited experience of some transcendent autonomous we, but a kind of bursting into the world of its unexpected potential, which despite everything is still invested with aesthetic and political hope. <laughs>